Bless. The Lord is so good. All the time I heard it. Hey, great. So you guys know. You guys know. Today's subject is Marching for Christ. That's the title today. Our young people, you and I even, are soldiers for Christ. Spiritual brethren in rank and file, ministering to the lost, sin-sick souls in this world. Today is going to be an appeal to my young people, young people to be involved, young people to be on fire for Jesus, young people to give their lives wholly and unreservedly to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Before I do, I'm going to offer a quick word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this morning, and thank you for all gathered here throughout this morning into the afternoon too. Lord, I pray in a special way that you please Help us to be unified as brethren and as perhaps spiritual soldiers for you, Lord. Please unite us in rank and file. Give me the words at your mouth. Please anoint me with your spirit as I speak to these, uh, these brethren here today. Please be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. So the subject, marching for Christ. All throughout the world, there are armies using child soldiers. Child soldiers are still used in more than 25 countries around the world. Some are willing combatants and others are forced to fight. Now, there has been wars and rumors of wars, the Bible says. There has been war between Russia and Ukraine, which has led to teenagers being drafted into the fight. Even the Nepalese people, some of their youth, have joined the Russian army in order to fight and get some war glory for themselves. And so there has been wars and fightings all throughout time, and children have been used at the forefront, young teenagers used. Young people have been marching for Hitler. Young people have been marching for Mussolini. Young people marching for Bosco. Young people marching for Putin. Young people marching for Zelensky all marching with guns, blood spattering across this world, carnage being wrought, youth being used in the fight for evil, and those, some youth even stand up for good to defend the rights and values that we even as Canadians has held dear. Paul wrote to the young minister Timothy, you endure hardness as a good soldier, endure because it's tough out there. Each and every one of us know life is tough, it's hard. And, of course, when we get into the world with all of the sin and the problems, we have a fight. We have a battle against evil. No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life that may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. As much as Alex and I are soldiers for Christ, so are you. So are our young people. Our young people are like arrows in the quiver. They're like our ammunition. They are our, our, our special, um, special uh, soldiers. You are all ministers for God. Never forget that. And we're all together marching for Jesus, aren't we? We're all on Team Jesus, right? We love Jesus and we follow him. But there's a problem. Many, sadly, have been caught up in the affairs of this life. They have been caught up in the barbed wire, entangled in the barbed wire of sin, of worldliness, and other issues, ensnared and immobilized by our own poor choices, doubts, and addictions. God wants his people, his young people, their hearts, their minds free to do his will. But how did our youth get ensnared by the consequences of their poor choices? How did they come to doubt in the first place? I believe young people have been deceived. But I believe everyone has been deceived in every generation. Satan has been at work since the beginning of time. He has been working on the past generation and the generation today, deceiving the people. Every generation has had its problems. Every generation has some lie or lies that they have bought into. Satan says today that you can give your life to pleasure. He says you can give your life to sex and drugs. Satan says you can give your life to making money, making money your God. Satan says you can have these things, let these things, he says, let these things be your God. They will satisfy you and you'll find fulfillment in them. That's his lie. After a while of giving your life to these things, especially money or power, you may find success you may even uh, find that you reach the top, but you experience a loneliness, an emptiness, 
There is a void in your heart that is a God-shaped void that only Jesus Christ can fill. You may very well be coming here today with a heart yearning for something more, a heart yearning for an experience with Jesus Christ, a heart yearning to be filled with the Spirit of God in a relationship with Him. Now, in the Hall of Faith, there is stories of individuals who've done so much for the Lord. We read in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 to 27, that by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, Moses had respect to the reward for godliness. Moses grew up in wealth and luxury. He was being prepared for the next pharaoh of Egypt, but he left it all. He was trained in military. He was trained in all kinds of worldly things, but that was not going to profit him. Moses put away sin. He put away pleasure-seeking. He put away the secular power. Why? Because he knew the reward for godliness and righteousness far exceeded any worldly gain. You know, all the uh, things of the world at some point are going to burn up. And if we are yoked up with Jesus and we have surrendered our hearts to him, we won't burn, but we'll get through the fire with Jesus. Moses. Moses would have thought, why reign as an earthly pharaoh when I can be a prince with God for all eternity? You know, why give my life to pleasure-seeking and money and things and material things when I know it's all going to burn away at some point? Now, Abraham, he accepted the challenge to go into a foreign land that he didn't know. He marched for God into a foreign land. Moses accepted the challenge to lead God's people out of Egypt. He marched through God in the wilderness. He marched for God through the wilderness. He marched for Jesus Christ. David, he accepted the challenge to fight Goliath. He was a soldier for God. He was someone who took on challenges and he overcame. Today, we are going to look at three things that are keeping youth from accepting the challenge to live the life of Christ. We will look at three things that are keeping youth from marching under the captain of our salvation, Jesus Christ. You know, the greatest challenge that our youth can take up is to follow Jesus with their whole heart and live the life of a Christian. It's tough. It's the most challenging thing you can do, but it pays off eternally. One thing that's keeping the youth from accepting the challenge to follow Christ is materialism. Youth are known to spend hundreds of dollars every year on the horizontal things of life. Youth are focused on the world and their possessions, focused on getting and getting. They have no time for God because they are focused on the horizontal things of life. No time for the vertical, a heavenward connection. No time for the spiritual things. And so when the great famine happened in Egypt, we read that Joseph wisely led Egypt to prosperity. Lots of the land and things were bought, and the Pharaoh became owner of it all. All the land became his during the Egyptian famine. Egyptians were wealthy and materialistic, so much so when the kings died, the pharaohs died, their tombs were filled full of their stuff. They loved their stuff. This materialistic, proud, paganistic prosperity was what led Pharaoh to take such a bold stance in hoarding a people to himself, namely the Hebrews. He wouldn't let them go worship. When I look at history, I see that materialism has been used and promoted to get rid of religion. The Marxist communist leader, Vladimir Lenin, thought the best way to get rid of religion is to promote materialism. He wrote that the ABC of Marxism is materialism. And so what is this materialism? Vladimir Lenin and his communists wanted to eliminate all religion. Their weapon was materialism. His idea was that society is to be organized to satisfy material needs alone. 
economic systems or modes of production are organized to satisfy human material needs. It was a philosophy of getting stuff and securing stuff. And so materialism is an effective weapon in wiping out religion. Materialism is foundational to atheism. He wrote, down with religion and long live atheism. The dissemination of our atheist views is our chief task. Materialism, an effective weapon. Yes, the devil knows that. The Bible says of the king of Tyre in chapter 28 of Ezekiel, he says, by your great wisdom and by your trade, you have multiplied your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. In Revelation chapter 3, we read of a church, a church period, in which the people in the last days, the Laodicean church, is rich and increased with goods and has need of nothing. It's oftentimes when we're absorbed with the things of life that we forget about God. We have everything, and so we feel we have no need of God. Philippians chapter 2, verses 4 to 8 says, do not let each man look upon his own things. Let each man also, in being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient, even unto death, the death of the cross. Jesus, king of kings, king of the universe, laid aside his kingly attire, wealth and heavenly comfort, to come here, to come to the sin-infested planet, he left his royal abode, his royal court, with all the pleasures of heaven to come here to save you and I. Jesus laid aside his heavenly material world and became a humble, poor man to save each and every one of you. Jesus Christ's example flies in the face of every self-indulgent, materialistic, ease-loving person across this globe. Jesus, our heavenly high priest and our king, left it all so that we could be saved. He sacrificed, even sacrificed himself. Jesus became poor so that you could become eternally rich. Do you care about that? Oh, yeah. Jesus lived to help people so that you in turn may receive help. Do you care about that? Jesus laid aside all of his riches and royalty up there in heaven so that you could be a prince or princess with Christ. Jesus loves you so much. He's given up so much for you. What will you do for Jesus in return? He loves you so much. Materialism is simply selfishness and atheism. In exchange for materialism, Jesus gives us something better. You'll see on your screen a wonderful quote from Ellen G. White from Volume 5 of the Testimonies, which says, Religion is love. Right in the heart there. Religion is love. Religion is not a grievous yoke. Religion is love. It's simply love. Jesus gives us love. The church, Christ's bride, gives us love. And we are to love and respect and uphold each other. Jesus loves us, and we are to share that love with each other. Now, the next one, the next one. Another thing that's keeping the youth from accepting the challenge to follow Jesus is that they have a shallow Christian experience. In a study... Uh, it's quoted here that Christian youth say that church is boring, that faith is not relevant to my career or interests, and the last one, or that the Bible is not taught clearly or often enough. Some of them say that God seems missing from my experience of church. So three primary statements and a fourth. The, thir the first primary statement is that church is boring. Church sure can be boring, it can be boring when we come here with wrong motives, when our hearts are not ready to receive Jesus and we're coming here for other reasons other than Jesus. When you come here to be just entertained, church will be boring. The world does entertainment better than the church quite often. When you come here to goof off, church will be boring. When you come here because your parents forced you to come here, church will be boring. But when you come here to worship God, you will, this worship will be exciting. When you come here to hold on to Jesus and talk to Jesus, church will be awesome. When you're coming here to get a communication from Jesus, oh yes, I'm listening, I'm here. That's the way it would be. When I was a student in Toronto, I was studying public health, 
I would actually go out of my way. I would go far just to travel to church on a bus on every Sabbath morning. I was so on fire for Christ that even other people saw it and they invited me to their churches to speak in their churches and so on. And so people got to know me in the GTA and Kortha Lakes because I love Christ and I wanted to share the message that I received. They could see that the fire of God's word was shut up in my bones and it's just ready to just blow out. Is that the way you feel about Jesus? That it's just a fire up in your bones that you just cannot keep to yourself. You want to share Jesus, you want to talk about Jesus, you want to tell him what the Bible says because you love the Bible and you love Jesus. Okay. Church will be interesting when you have a heart burning for God. Now, second statement. Faith is not relevant to my career or interest. This statement tells me that there's some incongruence. The statement indicates that there's a separation between one's beliefs, their values, and the areas of work and their personal activities. In other words, church is church, religion belongs at church, but religion doesn't belong in my life. It's something I do every, at the end of every week, but it's not something daily that I live. And so how do we make faith relevant? Faith is made relevant by going to the Word and studying it for yourself. Faith is made relevant by following the principles from the Bible and allowing that to direct your career choices, allowing that to direct you in what you say, do, dress, whatever. Faith is made relevant by networking, mentorship, and finding like-minded believers who share your career or interest goals. Church is a great place for that. When you don't come to church, you don't make friends. And when you don't come to Sabbath school, that's one of the great times where you get to socialize and talk about the Bible and learn. I'm trying to restart the, the teenager class down in the basement there in the boardroom. And I need more people. I need more youth. And parents, urge them to come. I'm there. I need youth leaders. I want Youth on Fire for Jesus to lead those studies. So parents, please. Young people, please get to know the word. Young people, have an experience with God. Please, learn. Now, last one. The Bible is not taught clearly or often enough. Now, it wouldn't matter so much what is taught from the pulpit when the people themselves become diligent Bible students. Now, let me quant qualify that statement, okay? Church is going to be irrelevant and boring when your study only consists of the sermon every Sabbath. I hope, I hope it's coming in. you got to have a daily experience in spiritual things. Shallowness of Christian experience can be caused by not studying the Bible every day, by not studying every day, by not praying every day, by not witnessing every day. And so I believe to spiritually live, we must engage in three primary things. In our physical nature, we all need to eat. Jesus said that the word of God is the bread. My word is the bread. My word is the nutrition you need. So you've got to feast on the Bible, and you've got to study it. Now, if you're kind of new to studying and you're like, well, how do I study? There's a lot of good, helpful resources out there. Um, I like to go visit my parents on Christmas, and we do like a gift exchange, right? Because it's Christmas. And so one of the things I put on there, everything I do is with a purpose. I, everything I ask for is purposeful. It's not just anything. And so you'll see in my hand, I got a brand new Bible. Yeah, it's fancy. It's called the... Platinum Edition Remnant Study Bible with LNG White Comments. Yeah. Now, if you guys look up the price of that, don't do it. It's Sabbath. But cha-ching, it's really good. It's got LNG White Comments. It's got these chain references. So if you're someone who wants to study the Word, doesn't know how very well, well, this is a good start. It has Bible studies in it right there. Okay. So you can also get Bible studies online and things too. You can even ask Pastor Alex and I, and we can teach you how to study. And so God will seem irrelevant, number one, if you're not studying the Bible. Number two, if you're not breathing. We all need to breathe, right? Our breathing is prayer. We talk with God, we get spiritual power from Him. And so we got to breathe, we got to pray every day. And thirdly, we have to exercise. 
If, we, if I didn't exercise, I'd be really big right now. I'm just barely keeping myself down at 220. So exercise is important. Exercise your faith, all right? You got to do it. Now, cross-connection. Christians are followers of Jesus. And when your faith is informing you, when you do engage in spiritual exercises, you'll be following Christ. In Christ, he's wonderful. He was active in creation. He was active in all kinds of things. He was active in redemption. He kicked the devil out of heaven. Jesus was not a spectator. And if we're followers of Jesus, we won't be spectators either. We'll be active. When we are uh, Christians, when we surrender our hearts to Jesus, we are activated for evangelism. So now, every call to service is an opportunity for a blessing. You'll see on the quote on the screen, it says, doing good is a work that benefits both giver and receiver. So when we don't give and when we don't help and when we don't support, guess what? You're losing out. You're losing out. You're losing out on the blessing. So when you see deacons and elders and ministry leaders and so on and so forth helping out and leading, do you know what? They're getting blessed. They're getting blessings. And so when you help out in programs and do certain things, you will receive a blessing. God promises it to you. Now, the last barrier that I'm going to cover today is the feeling that the youth must choose between their friends and their faith. Many young adults struggle with the exclusivity of Christianity. In one study, 29% of young Christians said that churches are afraid of the beliefs of other faiths. I don't know about me, but as a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, I'm very, very strong in my faith. I'm not afraid. I am not afraid of Islam, Hinduism, or anything, because I believe in Jesus, I believe the word and its authenticity and its power. Right? I encourage you to be bold in the faith. Now, should you have, should you have to choose between your friends and your faith? It depends on what those friends stand for and what they are all about. Proverbs 12:26 says, "The righteous is more excellent than his neighbor." But the way of the wicked seduces them. Seduces them. Seduce, lead astray and away. When your friends have no relish for God and for spiritual things, they will try to lead you away from Christ and his church. The New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Don't be deceived. Evil companionships corrupt good manners or morals. Youth who frequent the company of bad or corrupt people will soon be as they are. You may first frequent their company because they're fun or because they've got some cool accomplishments. Maybe your buddy is jacked and he's tough and you like to work out with him, so on and so forth, whatever it is. But if that person is not following Christ, if that person has no relish for God, his law, or nothing, and is consistently leading you away and astray, don't follow that person. Don't be with them. You may frequent their company for all kinds of reasons. But if it's not to evangelize, if it's not to witness, you're in danger. Proverbs 13.20 says, He that walks with wise men shall be wise, but a company of fools shall be what? That's it. It's very clear. I don't think I need to add any more to that. But when your friends are sinners, they're foolish sinners, and they don't want anything to do with God or Christ, if you follow along with them, you're going to end up in the same place they will. Eternal destruction. We imitate those we love. So we say, show me his company, and I'll tell you the man. Let me know the company he keeps, and I shall easily guess his moral character. When you make friends with people who hate God and love sin, you'll end up being like them too. Christians are selective about who they hang out with. Friends can have an impact on you positively or negatively. So it matters who you associate with. It matters a lot. Now, you'll see a little quotation on the screen that says that Jesus befriended people in their need. In their need. 
Jesus only befriended people who sought help from God. He befriended people who were in need. And when he met their need, their conversion soon followed. If you look at a little study about who Jesus' friends were, I only have a short study here, but you'll see some of the names. There was an adulterer, a fornicator in John chapter 8. She sought forgiveness, and she found forgiveness in Christ. She was a sinner, but she was saved. Mary was a great sinner, Luke chapter 7. She sought forgiveness, she got it, she was saved. There was also Mary Magdalene, who was described as a demoniac. She sought deliverance from Christ. She was a sinner, she sought deliverance, and she was saved. Matthew, Levi, and Zacchaeus, tax collectors. They, they, they yearned, they longed to follow Christ. And so Matthew left his job. And then Zacchaeus, he abandoned his corrupt practices and he followed Christ. They sought purpose, they sought forgiveness, and they sought restoration. When you're looking around on who to look at and who to evangelize and who you can spend time investing in, you want to look for people who, have, uh, who are seeking for purpose, who are seeking for some sort of forgiveness or freedom and some sort of restoration. Look for people like that. Look for people who are seeking and fulfill them and help them. Now, these people were repentant people. They were not open enemies of Christ and his church. Now, don't get me wrong. When we see an avowed atheist who is blurting off all kinds of things, we can minister to them. We can share with them the truth. But we don't need to hang out with them every day and, and make constant friends with them. Now, Satan, he propels wicked people into your life to ruin you. Jesus, he gives us the best things, the best people, the best friends. And some of the best friends that you can make are here in this church. Keep your butts firmly planted in our programs, in our events, and in our pews. The Lord will increase you and encourage you and help you to grow and prosper. God sends people in your life to prosper you, not to tear you down. God wants you to develop. God wants you to be great. And so it's much better to be a follower of Christ and to accept the friends he suggests to you. Now I'm going to tell you a story. This is a story that comes from China. Chinese officials from the Public Security Bureau they invaded a Sunday school in 2005 in China. And what happened was they took the kids and they threw them all in a van. These were Christian kids, right? So if you know about China, right, they, they're not too friendly to Christians. And so all these Christian kids yanked from their Sunday school, thrown in a van, and one child begins to sing. I don't speak Chinese, so I'm not going to try to sing it. <laughs> but they began to sing. And that one child began to sing, then the, all the children began to sing in that van. Singing where? Going where? To the prison. Upon arrival at the police station, the children marched bravely into the interrogation room. They were soldiers for Jesus, still singing to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, do you have a song in your heart? When trials and temptations come, you can start singing? Mm. These children did. Now, the Chinese officers attempted to force the children to write, I do not believe in Jesus, telling them that they had to write it a hundred times before they would be released. Instead, do you know what the children wrote? They wrote, I believe in Jesus today. I believe in Jesus tomorrow. I will believe in Jesus forever. Forever. Is that your experience? I believe. The officials called the children's parents, some of whom renounced Christ to have their kids back. Yeah, so sad. But did they all do it? There was one parent who was a widow. She went in, and the officers threatened her, saying, if you do not deny Jesus, we will not release your sons. So she had a choice to make. And this is what she said. She said, well, I guess you will just have to keep them because without Jesus, there will be no way for me to take care of them. She knew Jesus as her Lord and provider. She knew Jesus as the one who had given her her kids in the first place. 
She knew the one that gives can also take away. And the one who has the ultimate authority over these Chinese bureaucrats was the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The question to ask at the end of life's race is not so much, what have I accomplished, but whom have I loved and how courageously? Are you courageously in love with Jesus? Are you a soldier in rank and file, not following as a mindless robot, but one who knows the captain of their salvation? One who knows and is willing to go the extra mile to die for their captain? Yeah. So what happened? Did that lady get her child back? Guess what the Chinese official said at that statement she said? They said, take your son and go. <laughs> they knew they weren't going to get this lady to quit on Jesus. Will you quit on Jesus? I hope not. But do you know the condition of your heart? Jesus knows. Young and old throughout time have courageously loved Jesus. Today, you can choose to follow the paths of Abraham, David, and Timothy. You can be among the people who courageously loved God and marched for him. Now, there's no Chinese official with their gun to your head today, but there is a crisis of worship coming. There won't be people yanking you out of a Sunday class, but they may yank you out of a Sabbath school class. There is a crisis of worship coming. And where will you stand in that day? Now is time to make a choice. Everyone is going to have to decide where their allegiance lies. You can be prepared for the mark of the beast crisis by deciding today that I will believe in Jesus today, I will believe in Jesus tomorrow, and I will believe in Jesus forever. Faith. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world in all trials. Today, as I'm wrapping up, will you make this commitment today to say, yes, Lord Jesus, I believe you today, I will believe you tomorrow, and I will believe you forever. Stand with me if you would like to make that commitment. Amen. Soldiers rank and file. The Lord knows your heart. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you. So many of us entangled, so many of us in peril. Lord, today we've taken a stand for you. See us through to the end. Be, have us prepared for the mark of the beast crisis. Today we make our commitment to stand with you. We choose to believe you today. Please help us to believe every day, tomorrow and forever. Bless us, we pray now, in Jesus' name, amen.